Hey, good evening. Sorry about posting this video so late. I had some internet issues today, and that's obviously not good when you're trying to do an internet-only class. So we're going to talk about the election of 1860 today. And to talk about the election of 1860, we really need to go back to 1856. Uh, there's a lot that happens right before the 1860s are going to have, uh, come about. And one of the things is the creation of this new political party that's going to be really important in American history. In fact, this party is still making history today. Um, right around 1856, there's going to be the No Nuss Nothing Party that we talked about earlier. They were the anti-Catholic, anti-immigration party. The Free Soil Party, which were anti-slavery and abolitionists from various groups of people are going to join together to create this brand new Republican Party. Um, the original Republican Party, they're anti-slavery, anti-immigration, anti-Catholic. They're kind of the, the alternative party to the, the Whigs and the Democrats. Uh, John C. Fremont's going to become their presidential nominee in 1856. I mentioned him when we talked about the California Trail and the Santa Fe Trail and the Oregon Trail. Uh, he was originally a guide on the Oregon Trail, and then he helped to map out the California Trail during the Manifest Destiny. So he's a pretty big name. President Millard Fillmore is going to run for re-election as a Whig, and then James Buchanan is going to run for president as a Democrat. And you can see there the results of 1856. Uh, Millard Fillmore, it's one of the worst uh, defeats for a sitting president ever. There have been some worse ones now, but at the time it was pretty bad. Millard Fillmore is only going to get eight electoral college votes. Um, John C. Fremont is going to get 114 electoral college votes. That's pretty good for a first-time party, the fact that they almost pull it off. But it's going to be James Buchanan, who's going to win 174 electoral college votes. He gets a little bit over 45% of the popular vote, and he is going to become the president in 1856. Now, James Buchanan, uh, traditionally he is seen as one of the worst presidents that this country has had. Um, some of the reasons why James Buchanan is looked at so badly is he tries to avoid slavery completely. He basically sticks his head in the sand, pretends slavery doesn't exist, and he doesn't want to deal with it. Uh, unfortunately, though, he's forced to deal with slavery when the Dred Scott case comes um, Dred Scott, you might have heard a little bit about him. He was a slave. He was born in Virginia in 1799. He never learned to read. He never learned to write. Well, in 1830, uh, Scott was 31 years old. His owners sold their estate in Virginia and moved to St. Louis, Missouri. Um, they were one of the first people to move into the Missouri Territory. And these owners, they sell Dred Scott to a military surgeon whose name was John Emerson. And for the next 12 years, Scott and his owner, John Emerson, are going to travel around through the non-slavery territories of Illinois and Wisconsin, uh, but their home base is still Missouri. Uh, John Emerson dies while Scott and John Emerson are in Illinois, and John Emerson's wife tries to hire out Dred Scott to other families in St. Louis, but Dred Scott is going to find a lawyer who will help him sue the Emerson family. And the reason they're suing is because Dred Scott claims that when he, or I should say his master died in a slave-free state or a slave-free territory, that meant that Dred Scott was a freed slave because he was in a non-slave area of the country. So the St. Louis court is going to rule in favor of Mrs. Emerson, then Dred Scott and his lawyer are going to appeal to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court takes up this case in the year 1857. And it's officially known as Dred Scott versus Sanford. Well, this is going to kind of set off a firestorm on both sides. Pro-slavery, anti-slavery people are going to be all over this court case. And what it comes down to is um, the Supreme Court is going to rule against Dred Scott. And a very famous statement by Richard Tanney, or Richard, I'm sorry, not Richard, but Roger Tanney, T like Tom, A-N-E-Y, that's the judge's name, Roger Tanney. 
he is going to make a very famous statement that says no african american whether slave or free could ever be considered a citizen since the founding fathers could not have intended such a result. Basically, the Supreme Court ruled that African Americans cannot be citizens and were not citizens. Really, what the Supreme Court is saying is that slave owners are protected from having their slaves taken away. And anti-slavery abolitionists are completely made angry by this and the abolitionist movement starts to get more and more radical. A great example of how radical this abolitionist movement gets is with the raid on Harper's Ferry in Virginia that happens on October 16th of 1859. On October 16th, 1859, John Brown, the same John Brown that we talked about on Tuesday with Bleeding Kansas, he leads a raid on a federal arsenal in Harper's Ferry, Virginia. A federal arsenal is basically a military base that has a bunch of guns. And John Brown is going to attempt to do this and attempt to start a slave revolt. Now, ironically enough, uh, somebody who's going to become a very important name, uh, Robert E. Lee, uh, he is the one who is giving credit with capturing John Brown and his men. And in the end, um, all the people were tried and hanged for this attack on Harper's Ferry. Now, what about Lincoln? We talk about Lincoln all the time uh, when we're talking about slavery and the World War, or not World War, but the, uh, the Civil War. Well, what you may not know about Abraham Lincoln is he, he was born in Kentucky in 1809, and he lived there as a kid. Uh, his mom was named Nancy Hanks, and she died while he was still a boy. Um, and Abraham Lincoln's dad, a guy named Thomas, is going to get remarried to a woman named Sarah. And it's actually Sarah, not his real mom, who raises Abraham Lincoln. Uh, in 1830, the Lincoln family are going to move to Illinois because there's some sort of uh, sickness going on in Kentucky. And when Abraham Lincoln gets a little bit older, he's going to work on riverboats traveling between Springfield, Illinois, and New Orleans along the Mississippi. In 1832, I don't know why I put 1830 there, but in 1832, he volunteers to serve in the Black Hawk War. You should remember reading the Black Hawk speech when he surrenders. Well, Abraham Lincoln volunteered to fight in that war, and he was elected captain of his company. But he never saw active duty. His company was still in training when Black Hawk was captured. Finally, Lincoln, he's going to start running for office in 1832. He's a member of the Whig Party. He runs for office in 1832. He wants to be a state representative for Illinois. He loses. He wins in 1834, and then he serves for eight years as an Illinois state representative. In 1837, Lincoln becomes a lawyer. He's a constitutional lawyer. Um, and then he's going to move to Springfield, Illinois, A, to open up a law firm, and B, because that's where the state capital of Illinois ends up being. In 1846, he's elected to Congress, and he becomes a U.S. congressman. And he serves one term. He moves to Washington, D.C. He, he serves there 1846 through 1848. And then he's going to return back home and he's going to be just a lawyer for a couple of years. Well, in 1854, he's going to run for U.S. Senate. In 1858, he's going to run for the U.S. Senate. And he loses both times. Uh, if you're wondering, that house right there that there's a picture of, that is the only house Abraham Lincoln ever owned. That is a national historic site in Springfield, Illinois. I've been there a couple of times. Springfield's actually where my family came from. That's where my dad grew up, so... I've been there a few times. That's a picture I actually took last um, about two summers ago. Now, the Lincoln-Douglas debates are going to become really, really famous. That's between Stephen Douglas, the same one who did Popular Sovereignty, Bleeding Kansas, all of that, and Abraham Lincoln. Uh, there were seven debates held throughout Illinois. There's one debate for each of Illinois' seven congressional districts. Douglas is going to defend popular sovereignty. Never mind, it didn't work in 
Kentucky, or not Kentucky, never mind, it didn't work in Kansas, it didn't work in Nebraska. Stephen Douglas, he's pretty much hitched his wagon to popular sovereignty. Lincoln's going to argue, on the other hand, that the nation, it cannot survive half free or half slave. Now, Lincoln's an interesting case. Uh, to him, slavery is immoral. He does not personally believe in slavery, but at the same time, he does not believe in racial equality either. He still believed in the white supremacy. He just didn't want slaves to be slaves. On top of that, remember I said Abraham Lincoln is a constitutional lawyer? It means he knows that he can't change the Constitution. He cannot stop slavery. Slavery must be ended with an amendment to the Constitution. Well, ultimately, Lincoln's going to lose the election, but he becomes a household name. Uh, Lincoln is known as a very good orator, meaning he can speak very well. And Lincoln's going to become the face of this, um, this northern anti-slavery movement, even though you know, he's saying, I can't end slavery. All right, so I said this was about 1860, so what about 1860? Well, here you go. The election of 1860, it had four major candidates. There was Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was actually a member of the Free Soil Party. He was not a Republican. Uh, he argued that slavery is immoral, but he argued at the same time, slavery is constitutional. He can't stop it. Uh, Abraham Lincoln fought against Native Americans. He resisted Native American rights when he was in Congress, when he was a member of the government. He was okay with having Native Americans move from their territory. And the Republican Party nominates him as their presidential candidate, too. Stephen Douglas, he is a Democratic candidate. Uh, the Democratic Party splits in 1860. There's a party meeting in Charleston, South Carolina. They can't decide on who they want to have as their candidate, so... Stephen Douglas is going to be nominated by the Northern Democrats. Popular sovereignty, let's do it. He's not against slavery. He says, let the people choose. Well, the Southern Democrats are going to choose a guy named John Breckinridge, who was the vice president of James Buchanan. Uh, John Breckinridge, he's an extreme supporter of Southern rights. He is an extreme supporter of slavery, and he becomes a candidate for the Southern Democrats. The fourth guy is John Bell. John Bell is basically the can't we just get along party. The Constitutional Union Party is just that. They're worried about keeping the union together. John Bell is going to avoid the idea of slavery completely. He is going to say, why don't we just preserve the union and figure it out? Well, Lincoln's going to win the election of 1860. Surprise, surprise. I bet you didn't know that. Um, but what's really interesting about the election of 1860, number one, Lincoln did not compete in the South. He knew he couldn't win any of the southern states. In fact, his name wasn't even on some of the ballots in the southern states. So Lincoln didn't bother. He just focused on the North where the most population was. Lincoln's going to win 180 electoral votes. Second place is John Breckinridge. He's going to get 72. Uh, he wins almost all of the southern states. John Bell gets 39 of the Electoral College votes, and then Stephen Douglas only gets 12. But notice, Stephen Douglas came in second in the popular vote. This is a perfect example of where the Electoral College votes and the popular votes don't match up. What ends up happening is Stephen Douglas gets second place almost everywhere. All right, so what happens after the election? Well, there are already rumblings that if Lincoln wins the 1860 election, that the South is going to secede. The South is going to leave the Union, and they're going to make good on that very quickly. There's a last-ditch effort by John Crittenden of Kentucky to offer what becomes known as the Crittenden Compromise. In this Crittenden Compromise, uh, John Crittenden is going to offer an amendment that extends the Missouri Compromise line all the way to California. No slavery north of the line. Slavery is okay south of the line. Uh, Southern congressmen are okay with it. The Southern congressmen say, if the North will agree to it, we'll agree to it. However, Republicans, 
they refuse after several months of the debate and they think this is their chance to kill slavery altogether now south carolina before i tell you about them today's word today's secret word is going to be internet the reason today's word is going to be internet is because i had internet issues today and this video is late because of it so today's secret word is internet all right back to south carolina south carolina is going to secede from the union on december 20th 1860. that's important because lincoln doesn't even become president until march 4th of the next year when south carolina secedes from the union the current president james buchanan he doesn't do anything. He basically says, okay, Abe Lincoln, this is going to be your problem. And Buchanan doesn't try to stop South Carolina from leaving the Union. South Carolina is also going to attack Fort Sumter in April of 1861. Fort Sumter is located in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina. If you've ever been to Charleston, this is the fort that's off in the water that you can see in the distance. Uh, when Lincoln becomes president, he basically takes the approach that if you don't do anything to us, we won't do anything to you. We'll figure this out. We'll work it out like a family. But when South Carolina attacks Fort Sumter, Lincoln has no choice but to declare South Carolina in open rebellion and move against it. What's going on in the South? Well, votes are taken in Southern states on whether they should leave the Union or not. South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas, they all secede before February 1st, 1861. Lincoln, once again, doesn't become president for another month. There are also votes taken in a couple other states. Tennessee, there's a vote taken. They do not vote to leave the Union at that time. Virginia has a vote. They don't vote to leave. And I think there's a vote also in Kentucky. In Kentucky, they don't leave either. So not all slave states leave when those other states do. They kind of take a wait and see approach. Well, the Confederate government's gonna be formed. Uh, there are delegates that meet in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, it takes eight days to form the government. They write a constitution. They base it almost 100% on the US Constitution. But there are a couple of exceptions. For number one, in the Confederate Constitution, the right to own slaves was protected. There was a presidential term limit of six years instead of four. And the Confederate president had the line item veto. Uh, to simplify what that means, the Confederate president could cross out whatever he wanted to from a bill and let the rest of the law pass. Jefferson Davis, who is a senator from Mississippi, is elected the president. And Alexander Stevens, who is from Georgia, he is elected president as well. All right, so that's your quick lead up to uh, the Civil War. Um, next week, that's what we're going to be talking about for both of our lectures is the Civil War. And this kind of gives you an idea of how we get there. So between this, this lecture and the lecture from Tuesday, you can see it wasn't just a snap decision. There was a lot of tension throughout the 1850s that leads to this election of 1860 and this election of 1860 is kind of the final straw that brings the the um the end of peace and starts the war all right so let me switch this over so you can see me um sorry about the light you know it's bright outside and i forgot to turn on the lights that are next to the computer but um, make sure you're working on your SLO. I'm getting any of the rough drafts that I still have to grade graded hopefully by Friday. So keep working on those. If you're going to take summer classes, please register for those. Um, um, everything on for the summer is going to be online, of course. And then last but not least, don't forget about those museum reviews. Since you can't go to an actual museum, make sure that you are looking at the virtual museums or you are looking at some of those historical films. And don't wait till last minute to turn those in. If you turn it in tomorrow, I'll create it for you tomorrow so you can get it done and out of the way. All right, until next time, we'll see you later.